Welcome to Board Game Breakfast. I'm Tom Vassell. Welcome aboard. This is a show all about board games and the people who play them. So what's going on with the Dice Tower this week? I'll be doing a live Q&A later today, so check that out. Come back and talk to me then. I'll also be doing a live Kickstarter crowd surfing show this coming Wednesday. And there's a live playthrough that will be running tomorrow. So there's a few live things going on this week as we jump into November. Oh, man, all the games that we have. So very many to talk about. And, of course, as always, we're going to start with the news. Okay, so first of all, a uh, new game from North Star Games, Oceans. This is a sequel to Evolution. I guess it's gonna, it uses the same art for sure, and maybe some other, but the, the mechanisms are going to be different. I think they're kickstarting it early next year. Simon has made a game based on Night of the Living Dead. Yes, yeah, the old movie there. That's, that's kind of interesting. It says on the cover, a zombie side game. But this is kind of interesting. Very rarely does an IP, especially a horror IP, interest me. But this one kind of does. So I'll be curious to see how this one comes across. Queen has announced some new games, one of them being Expedition Luxar, which is set in the Luxar universe. Didn't realize it was a universe, but hey, whatever. Make a board game and you've made a universe. WizKids has announced a few new things. Warhammer Age of Sigmar, Rise and Fall of uh, Anvilar. It's a really long name of a game. So Games Workshop has been making its own games, but almost all of them exclusively are miniatures that you can then use in Warhammer games. So this looks like something different, kind of like a, a defense of a city game. It's done by the, designed by the same guy who designed Nations. So I'm very excited about this one. I hope it's a great game. Uh, they also announced Waterdeep Dungeon of the Mad Mage. So this is not has anything to do with Lords of Waterdeep other than the theming. Uh, but this one looks like a, you know more of a full throttle D&D miniature style game. John Kowaleski from Gale Force 9, or formerly from Gale Force 9, has started a new company called Monster Fight Club. Uh, so that's, that sounds like the name of a game, actually, rather than the name of a board game company or a game company. But we'll see what they do as time goes by. And Pandasaurus has hired Jonathan Gilmore as a full-time designer slash developer. Jonathan has made some really great games. I don't know which, I mean, obviously he worked with them on Dinosaur Island, but he also has done Dead of Winter. So this is, uh, I think, exciting news. We're starting to see more designers go in-house with specific companies. Not a bad thing in my opinion. All right, that's the regular news. Let's go to Kickstarter. Hello, fellow gamers. So we have a rather big lineup this week of reprints and expansions, I know. I just totally told you guys that I was not going to talk about expansions a whole lot and stuff. But this week, there's just a bunch of really noteworthy ones. So we're going to go over those at the end. And I do have a few new Kickstarters for you as well. But next week should be a little bit better with like fresh new Kickstarters and just a few expansions and stuff. So let's get started. First up, we have Reavers of Midgard. This is by Gray Fox Games, and it's for two to four Vikings looking to pillage villages, fight monsters, and of course, bring glory to your clan, as you'll be using skill positioning and worker placement to get the most out of your turns. You'll also be recruiting reavers with specialized dice and skills to fulfill your Viking's journey straight to Valhalla. In the sequel to Champions of Midgard that comes with some really sweet Kickstarter exclusives, including all wooden components. This game runs for $69, and it plays in about 75 to 90 minutes. But if you're a fan of the first game, I would certainly put this on my list. Now, speaking of the high seas, we have Ever Rain by Grimlord Games. This is for one to four captains trying to stop the scourge of the Ever Rain by exploring the fog of war in this modular board game that challenges you to maintain your crew and manage sailing through the deep while trying to find villages and islands with clues on it in this highly narrative game that takes about 30 to 180 minutes to play. 
A pledge for this game will cost you $110, but I really enjoyed the versatility and the choices that you can make while exploring the narrative of this game. Now, on to the expansions and reprints. First up for our reprint is Project Elite. This is being reprinted by Cool Mini or Not Games, which, go figure, has really stepped up their minis in this game, as they've taken this real-time cooperative board game and fully redone the art, giving it a darker and gritty feel. And they have exclusive Kickstarter figures, of course, including, including guys, a Zombicide Invader crossover. So if you are interested in that, make sure to pick it up. The next one we have is Welcome to the Second Printing with Neighborhood Expansions. I am so excited about these Neighborhood Expansions, guys, because they're going to have four different neighborhoods. They have only released two of them, one which is Halloween Town, and then they also have an a Outbreak Town. You also get the associated city plans with this. They're also offering a neoprene mat and dry erase sheet. So if you haven't purchased the game already, this is a great time to pick up the full game along with these new sheets. Or if you just need the new sheets, you can just back those, which is fantastic. Next up, we have Munchkin Steampunk Girl Genius by Steve Jackson Games. This is a 56 card expansion for the base game that adds new spark abilities. And the really exciting thing about this is the artist Phil Folio who does the Girl Genius comics. I love that he's coming back, and he already did the art for Munchkin Steampunk, but adding that Girl Genius flavor to that is amazing because I'm a super big fan of the Girl Genius comics. Now we have Deep Madness, the second printing. This is by Dimension Games, and it's a full reprint of their game, as well as they've added tier for previous backers to just pick up the new items and exclusives. They also have this really cool set where they have included the Kickstarter exclusives from the last Kickstarter. So if you want to go in and just back this whole game, you can pretty much pick up from where the last Kickstarter left off at, which is really nice. And last up, we have Bios Origins. Now this is a set of three games. The first one is a new game, which is Pax Transhumanity. And then they have two reprints, which is Bios Origins and Pax Porfiriana, which I'm not super familiar with these games, but it is super exciting whenever a designer goes back to a game and then tries to revamp it and make the rules a little bit nicer and just give it a newer feel to the game. So I hope all of you guys enjoyed the Kickstarters for this week. I know it was a lot of reprints and expansions, and I told you I wasn't going to do that. But if you are interested in hearing more about any of these Kickstarters or campaigns going on, make sure to hit me up on social media and gloryhound.com. You can look me up on Twitter, Facebook. Everything is just gloryhound with two Ds at the end, okay? Um, and join in on the conversation because we have a super awesome 30-minute show that we do on Fridays talking all about the nitty-gritty details of these Kickstarters that you guys might be missing so other than that, I will talk to you guys all next week. Have a good one. You have a friend over and you say, hey, let's play a game. He says Yahtzee. You say war game. Well, let's compromise. Table Battles, a game designed by Tom Russell and published by Hollenspiel. In this game, you have eight battles, and this is what a setup of a battle looks like. Starting from the Battle of Ivory, the 14th of March, 1590, to the last battle, the Battle of Brooklyn Heights, the 27th of August, 1776. Now you're probably wondering, Dan, where's the board? This is not a war game, and you said Yahtzee. What's Yahtzee about this? So the board is created from the cards. We take this Brooklyn Heights battle, you'll see first player, colonialist, let's say that's you. So you choose the cards, 39B to 42B. The second player chooses British and their vile Hessians, and you choose cards 36B to 38B, making the game area look like this. I know what you're saying, Dan, Yahtzee. So before we get into Yahtzee, let me explain the card. 
On the blue strip, you'll see who's fighting. The number to your right means there's going to be six sticks in front of that card. What's a stick? Well, it's an army in line formation. Then the number below the blue line is a six in parentheses, meaning that you need to roll a six and you put a die next to it. So with your roll of six, this is what you can do. You can attack. Who do you attack? Grant. You inflict one hit per die. So you remove one of those stick things. Now you're saying, Dan, Dan, this is too easy. Come on. So this is the guy Sterling is attacking, Grant, and as you see below where it says counterattack, if he has a pair of dice, well, he can counterattack. Who can he counterattack? You, Sterling. And what does that do? That gives him one hit, and additionally, he negates one of your hits. And that means he gets back one of those stick things. So with a three-page rulebook, 50 cards offering you many different possibilities, yes, easy game with depth, this is a two-player game easily soloable. Table battles, three pages of rules, Yahtzee mechanic, makes this game easy peasy. Published by Hollenspiel, designed by Tom Russell. Thank you for watching, and if you want to know what's happening in more games, please check out my channel, No Enemies Here. See you next week. Hi, Suzanne here with this week's featured board game app. Race for the Galaxy is a really popular card game that has a fair amount of complexity, especially in the use of iconography. Well, how does that convert into the board game app world? Let's take a look. In Race for the Galaxy, you build out your space civilization using cards that represent planets and technologies. Each card has a variety of attributes and abilities and scoring impacts that can be contextual based on what action phase you're in. Those action phases are determined by players who secretly select what action they want to take each round. But all players get all actions selected. And there's a huge kind of uh, what will my opponent do element to the game. Over a decade old now, Race for the Galaxy is still hugely popular for its engaging and complex gameplay. The Race for the Galaxy app was clearly crafted with care by Temple Gates Games. There are three levels of AI that you can play against and an option to play an experienced two-player game that allows for double action selection and other action tweaks. The online play is stellar. You can play against strangers or friends and I found the online game flow to work exceptionally well. But I fell in love with the Race for the Galaxy app when I played the tutorial. It takes a page out of video game tutorials and eases players into the action a few action options at a time in the interactive tutorial. Not only does this do a great job of familiarizing people with the app interface, it really helps teach the game itself. If you've had trouble with the iconography in Race before, I suggest trying the app tutorial. That can help you out with it. Because my phone is always on me, I find I play the game more on that, but it's definitely easier to see all those card icons on a tablet-sized screen. Three of the game expansions are currently available as IAP, and I hope they add more. Race for the Galaxy does an excellent job blending the analog into the digital. The app is polished and available for iOS, Android, and Steam. If this type of game appeals to you at all, I highly, highly recommend the Race for the Galaxy app. Hey there, everyone. It's Jen, the board game librarian, flipping some pages and pushing some cubes with this week's segment, From the Page to the Table. This week, I'm going to focus on one of my all-time favorite authors and one of my favorite books that they've written, and that is The Age of Innocence by Edith Wharton. Uh, like many other high school students, I read uh, Ethan Frome, and he was fine. Probably not the right time in my life to have read kind of a complex book like that. But in college, I took a Henry James and Edith Warren class, and I fell in love with her all formally for the first time. The Age of Innocence is one of those books that it's 1870s New York, and we have upstarts, we have new money, and we have passion, intrigue, a love triangle. It's funny because you know that phrase, keeping up with the Joneses? Well, Edith Wharton was the Joneses. Her family was so rich, early Newport money, that she kind of sets the standard. And she was deeply immersed in this universe and world because she lived it. Um, we're lucky enough that we live close enough to the Mount, her home in Lenox, Massachusetts. And it's wonderful. It's a wonderful place. That's why when Obsession, uh, published by Kayenta Games, came knocking on my doorstep. 
it's kind of the game I always wanted wanted in my life um, because when you're a serious gamer and you're looking for something that captures this theme, this is it. Dan has done a wonderful job in capturing all of that and done it very tastefully and respectfully to the time period. He's done an immense amount of historical research and making everything very accurate. Gameplay is super fun too, where you're kind of uh, building up your tableau of different tiles and using um, characters in your deck. Uh, all done in a way that just makes me feel like I'm at um, a party at the Age of Innocence. It's a wonderful game. The meeples in this are outstanding. Some of my favorite. That's all for this week. Happy breakfast, everyone. Hello, everyone. My name is Annette, and you may know me as Netter's Plays. And today on Applied Mechanics, I'm going to go over the game of Coimbra. So there is a lot going on in this game. And one of the key features that I want to go over is the dice drafting element. So let me show you a little bit about this and why I really like it. So this is the game of Coimbra and you have a lot going on in it. You have this map where players can travel, these different tracks where you're trying to gain more stuff like points or coins or guards. Every player will also have their own player board and you have these different characters that you're going to try to add on to your player board. But how do you do that? You do that with dice. The first player will roll the dice, and then players will pick one at a time which die they want, known as dice drafting. When a player picks their die, then they'll add it to their nifty little die holder. The player will then place their die in any one of these four different areas, which will guide them to which card they can potentially gain. The value of the die will matter because when you place it in a certain area, if it's the highest value, then it will be first in turn to grab one of these cards. Based on the value of this die, the player will then have to gain these cards by either paying coins or guards to take the card into their play area. Based on that color, you'll then score or gain a certain amount of coins, guards, or even points. So as you can see, I only scratched the surface of this game because there's so much more going on but I really enjoy the dice drafting element of it. And the part that I really enjoy is that when players are taking one dice, they're deciding at that point where they're gonna place it. And that matters a lot because it'll dictate what place they're gonna be in turn order for that row. And not only that, but also the potential cost they're gonna have to pay. Another cool thing about it is at the end of the round, you also score or gain different things based on the tracks that you're moving forward. And it's all based on the color of the die as well. So not only do you have to incorporate the value of the die, but also the color of it as well. And that's why I really enjoy Coimbra. Well, thanks so much for joining me and we'll see you next time. Bye. <coughs> <coughs>coming from the dice tower this week well first of all we have another top 10 coming your way from our top 100 games of all time and i already mentioned some of the live stuff that we'll be doing throughout the week also mandy suzanne put up a new podcast for uh, on the dice tower network of which has a lot of other podcasts as for reviews i'll be taking a look at this little puzzle called dog pile this little card game called flutter fuse this little card game called mesozoic this kid's game, Downspin, Monopoly Gamer, Nyctophobia, Combo Fighter, kind of like a Street Fighter style game. I'll be doing a full review of Key Forge, and now that I have the starter set and have played it a whole lot more. This interesting game called Raccoon Tycoon, Reichholt from Uwe Rosenberg, I know a lot of people are interested in that one, and Blackout Hong Kong. Ooh. Ooh, all right, so some very hot games, some small games. We'll always like to try to do a mix of those. And, of course, Sam and Z doing things this week. So buckle up and be ready. Hi, folks. This is Jonathan for Harsh Opinion, and I'm back after a few rough weeks. I wasn't there because I have a personal tragedy in my family, but that's another story. And today's topic is going to be uh, do you have a personal best board game designer? And if so, are you gonna buy all of their games regardless if the game fits your personal taste? Or are you only gonna select 
uh, the games do you really want based on your personal taste like you will do with any board game designers, any games. For my part, my personal board game designers, uh, my personal best board game designers is Stefan Fell, and one of his earlier designs was In the Name of the Rose. It's the only game I was missing from him except for um, a kid's game, a German kid's game, a kid's game about soccer. And this one was the uh, the only one, the only game that, that was missing from my collection like a couple of years ago. And I, I, I was able to seek him out. And after playing it, I knew it right away, even before playing it, that it, was, it wasn't my type of games. But after playing, I was right. It is not my type of games. I don't like those type of games. It's not a bad game per se, but it's not a great game either. It's one of his earliest design. And I knew it right away uh, before buying it that it didn't fit my taste. So I repeat my question. If you have a personal best board game designer, are you gonna buy all of their games or just the one that fits your taste? Please leave a comment in the section below and I'm gonna try to answer them all. Thank you for watching. See you next time, guys. Bye-bye. It's your turn. Ooh. Hi, I'm Randy. I'm Alan. Welcome to Games Just Played. Where's the game, babe? Uh, don't have a game today. We're going to talk about uh, conventions. Conventions. These are our first conventions that we're going to. Yep, we have uh, never been to a convention, and we're going to go... <laughs> to the, uh, a local con called uh -huh. Game Hole Con in Madison, Wisconsin. Yeah. Uh, we're going there, what, November 10th? November 10th, we'll be there. Just one day. Yeah. Uh, just give it a test go, see how it runs, and <laughs> and uh, uh, yeah, it's, uh, we're not exactly sure what all to expect, yeah, but it really uh, should I'm be a lot of fun. I'm actually like nervous. <laughs> Why would I be nervous about that? I don't know. Um, I'm excited though. I think we're gonna meet a buddy there, and I, we might bring a couple games, is that right? Yeah, I think we'll bring a game or two just to have. Um, yeah. I know they have a library. I don't know how big it is or anything. I don't mm -hmm. know much about it. We don't know a whole lot, but we're going to go and have some fun. <laughs> we're um, going to give it a shot. Yeah, we're going to try it out. Um, and then also we're going to be going to PAX Unplugged. Yeah. In December 1st is when we'll be there. Yeah, we'll we wanted to games. get one that had like a good yeah. amount of, you know, a good size and everything. Yeah. Kind of get a feel for uh, some of the bigger cons too and, yeah. and see how that goes. And. Uh, we're gonna make a whole trip out of it we and do are. like, uh, like Washington D.C. and yeah. New York and Philly and all that. So, yeah, yeah we're really looking forward to it. I'm so, so excited. And in case you're wondering about the local one, it's in Madison. It's called Game Hole Con, Game right? Game Hole Con. And everyone was like, "That's the weirdest name," and I totally agree. It's bizarre, but somebody i don't know if this is true said that one of the gaming rooms there was called that so it's actually like historical so i think that's pretty cool i'm sure. just gonna go with it i'm just gonna go with it's it it's a convention to me <laughs> so <laughs> it is what it is in case you're wondering why we're outside right now in the pitch black in freezing cold weather all the kids are awake and inside so it's yeah. very loud it's not very quiet inside. no and so in fact our, our kid is going dad dad right now so yep. <laughs> hopefully you can't hear that. so if you're going to be at all in the uh, game hole con madison wisconsin mm -hmm. area november 10th uh shoot Come us a message us. we'll try to get a game together and pax unplugged we're going december 1st which yep. is that saturday also so it's gonna be fun hit us up hope to see you guys there bye bye Greetings and welcome to the Mega Meeple. I am Thomas Grogan. <sighs> you ever get the feeling that society is going down the tubes? When I see a game that actually fosters people sitting down, learning and listening and finding out more about one another in a peaceful manner, I take notice. Now, I was sent this game by Authentic Agility Games called How Do You See the World? This is currently available on Amazon, but basically this game has a series of cards and there's quite a few, they're pretty good size, and there are five categories to discuss. But the rules of this game is very, very simple. Listen carefully, no judgment, and be authentic. As I said, the cards each have five categories on it. So an example of the uh, questions you could get in the category of reflections, describe a time in your life that you look back on and smile. In the relationships category, 
How did your grandparents' lives impact yours? In the aspirations category, if you could be anyone, who would you be and why? In the life's purpose category, what lights you up about what you do? And then in the final category is beliefs. Describe a time when you questioned your beliefs. So if you're looking for a party game where people are willing to sit down and learn how to listen and learn about the other people, check out How Do You See the World by Authentic Agility Games. You just might learn something new about somebody else. Hi, Mike Lisio from Solo Mode Games. Today I want to talk about a topic that I seem to be seeing pop up more and more on the Board Game Geek threads, and this is related to games that are coming out with second, third, sometimes even fourth editions that are making changes based on player feedback or perhaps errata that's being found throughout the course of play. What I'm hearing is that more and more, and I think it might be tied into the influx of Kickstarter games, is that more and more People that buy first edition copies of games or get in on the ground floor of a Kickstarter campaign are feeling almost like beta testers because they're finding errors that weren't found throughout play testing or through the prototype process. And so this could be potentially an issue if you're getting a game early because you're excited about it and you're finding a number of issues with the game and they make a second printing maybe through a Kickstarter campaign or maybe just through the course of regular retail production and there are some significant changes. Now, sometimes it might just be a little bit of an errata in the rule book and I think most people would not have a huge issue with that, certainly I don't, but there have been times and it does seem to be happening more recently where some pretty significant changes are occurring between these printings where card changes are occurring or board changes are occurring and uh, in addition to the rule book and errata this is creating a pretty different game experience and the people that got in early are maybe feeling like they're beta testers like they are doing the hard work uh, for the people that are getting the game later on so i was interested in your thoughts on this do you feel like this is becoming more of an issue in the board gaming hobby is it an issue at all is this something that's always been happening let me know in the comments below i'd love to hear what you think Thank you so much for your time, and have a great day. Hey, my Tom Thinks This Week is inspired by a question from Winnie. Winnie asked me about the games like the World of Yoho or Chronicles of Crime, which I reviewed very positively last week. And she said, these games look good and all, but aren't they essentially just a very expensive app? Uh, she didn't want to pay for more, you know, more than $10 for an app. These are too expensive. And then where is this line between board games and apps? Well, that line is certainly blurry these days. I find it kind of intriguing to me how apps have kind of ruined people's monetarily perception of things in general. Uh, there's so many apps on the internet that are free but then they have in-app purchases, which essentially adds up to a huge amount of money unless you play them always free, in which case the experience is almost always not nearly as good, with a few exceptions like Hearthstone and things like that. Video games have always cost $40, $50, $60. It's only in recent years that apps have come down in price. So when I look at something like Chronicles of Crime and uh, World of Yoho or Mansions of Madness or what have you, I look at, hey, I'm getting this app, but I'm also getting these physical components, this board game, and then I don't consider it to be too expensive. Now remember, something being expensive is relative. A very rich person might go to a steak dinner that costs 50, 60 bucks and think nothing of that, while a poor family, that's something you have to save for for months and months to get to that point. And so how expensive something is is going to be relative to each person, which is why I very rarely mention price in my reviews to begin with because I might say, well, this is really expensive, and you might think, no, it's not, or vice versa. Now, there is the possibility sometimes when a game seems extremely expensive or extremely inexpensive that we'll mention it, but for the most part, I don't do it for that reason. So I don't think these games are overpriced at all. You get the app and then you get some physical components that you use and you put them together. If you do think they're expensive, then I completely understand it. And if you think, if you think they're just an app, well, then I can't really help you there because I think they're much more than an app. I think you have an app mixed with a board game and the combination, especially with Chronicles of Crime, is an incredibly fun, immersive, terrific experience. 
Now, the line between board games and apps, like I said, very blurry. Is that legitimately called a board game when you're using an app for the entire thing? I don't see why not. It's the same as if you have a board game with some sort of electronic component. My electronic component for this one just happens to be this very expensive phone. Um, so if people are going to differ on that, but we're definitely going to talk about them on our show. We're definitely going to point things out in regards to this because they are interesting and they're fun. And if you're a board gamer, I think you'll like them. If you're looking for apps that cost one, two, three dollars, you're probably not going to be as big of a fan. But I think the experience is completely worth it. Everything's relative. Uh, a game of Chronicles of Crime, in which I can play, I think, what, six, seven times out of the box with completely different scenarios for the price. And I could take my whole family to the movies, which would cost more than Chronicles of Crime one time. Again, it's, they're, they're different experiences, and it's hard to evaluate them up against each other. So we just do our best here. On this show, we talk about board games. And even though these games have extensive use of apps, I think they count. Hey everyone, on today's breakfast, I want you to spend a couple of minutes with me so I could dazzle you with the amazing artwork for Space Cowboys Orbis and the very talented David Tosello. Orbis is a tactical game of world development and resource management in which players take on the roles of gods creating their best universes. David does wonders with his very fun art style and it shines on this game. The game, for some reason, seemed to be all over my social media, and once I saw the art, I walked right over to the local game store and had to pick it up. David's art is on the God and City tiles, which are the main components of this light but very thinky drafting game. Each character designed for the God tiles is extremely different, and the cities have incredible detail, from the forest cities to the volcanic. Make sure you spend a few minutes checking them out, because it's fun noticing things that I might have missed in previous playthroughs. David is an artist from Italy and has a few games under his belt. He shows off some of that art plus other projects on his blog, davidtosello.blogspot.com. He posts everything from finished pieces to works in progress to loose break time sketches. He also has a link to his Facebook page, at Tose Art, in which he shows off more of his board game projects and you can even check out videos of him sketching while at conventions. He is also on Instagram at David underscore Tosello underscore art, which he peels back the curtain a little further. You get to peek a little bit into his personal life and check out even more beautiful pieces. Well, I'm happy to have stumbled upon this game and now David has a friend for life. For sure, I'll be looking out for future projects and we'll be picking them up without a doubt. Well, that's it this week. Be sure to check me out on various social media and until next time, enjoy your breakfast, guys. Hey, this is Mike with the Board Game Makeover. Last few weeks, I've been doing my seasonal job at Bob's Corn so that I can earn money in order to go to like Dice Tower Convention, Dice Tower Cruise, Gen Con. That's how I'm able to afford it. So that second job takes up a lot of my time as I'm doubling my hours per week. What am I doing now? I'm done. I got this award. It's called the Cream of the Crop Award. Well, actually, everybody who worked there got one, but still, I got an award. And in this episode, I'm going to continue my top 10 awards with you that I started in my last video. I went from 10 down to 6. Now I'm going to do 5 down to my number 1 board game makeover award that I gave to myself. Let's get going. Number 5, best series. Games on a plane where I took five different games and made them fit into a magnetic case. These games were Room 25, Pandemic, Roll Fort, Cosmic Encounter, Mashup, and Jamaica. Number four, best expansion. Room 25 expanded to Room 49, where I added additional tiles to the game to make the game more intriguing, a little more difficult at times, but definitely a bigger game overall. Number three, best visual expansion. Cult Express. I found giant trains at Goodwill, and I was able to cut them apart, open them up, and add my own experience so that we no longer had cardboard trains, but we had real trains. Number two, most favorite makeover, Dragonwood rethemed to Pokemon Go, because I love playing Pokemon Go. And Pokemon Go gets me out walking and I meet new people all the time. And Dragonwood was the perfect retheme for this. And my number one board game makeover award is best retheme theme. Of course, that is The Simpsons. 
because The Simpsons are everywhere on the internet and you can pull artwork from anywhere and add them to your game somehow. So giving myself awards can be a very daunting task as I have to go through all the videos, look at all my projects I've done and figure out which was the best, the worst, the longest, the shortest, things like that. And now that I have a little more time on my hands, I'm going to be playing some Pokemon Go. Now you know what you can do with those extra iPhone 5s. They fit on your wrist. Oh yeah. Thanks for watching the Board Game Makeover. I'll see you next time. Hello guys, it's Cardboard Rhino and welcome to one more Rhino Says Yes. Today we're gonna have a look at a very exciting and simple tactical racing game with bicycles and lots of French finesse. It's Flamme Rouge. In Flamme Rouge each player has two riders. One is the sprinter and the other one is the rouleur. And to make me sound a bit less ridiculous, let's call them sprinter and ruler. And you compete against the other players for the first place past the finish line. There's different tracks that you can set up according to the different stage cards. Starting around, we have the energy phase where players simultaneously draw four cards for each of their riders and play one. The remaining three cards are recycled by being placed face up at the bottom of their respective rider decks. In the movement phase, all played cards are revealed and all riders, starting with the frontmost one, one, move the exact number of squares of their cards. A rider can move through other riders, but if they need to end their movement on a fully occupied square, they must stop in the first square behind it with a free lane. Last, to end the round, the cards you just played are removed from the game completely, and then starting with the backmost pack of riders, if there is exactly one empty square in front of them, then the pack gains a slipstreaming and moves one square forward. Last thing is the exhaustion. If a rider has an empty square in front of them, they gain one exhaustion card, which is recycled in their deck. There's also some mountains that can help you or hinder you depending on how you handle them. The ascending track of the tile prevents you from moving more than five squares and from doing slipstreaming, whereas the descending track moves you a minimum of five. There's also a great expansion, the Meteo, which adds weather effects, adding a bit more complexity to the gameplay, and it introduces the crashes. Now, riders on a wet tile can crash if the square they needed to finish their movement on is occupied. This blocks the entire square, hinders slipstreaming and has a penalty on their next move. Flamme Rouge implements the bike racing theme very gracefully and it's exciting from the beginning till the end. There is lots of tactics like how to slipstream, when to break away from the pack, how to manage the mountains and how to adjust your moves according to the cards you pull and how well you compare to your opponents. So Rhino says a big yes to Flamme Rouge, you should definitely take it for a ride. This week in Gaming with the People, Kodinka. That's what this game is called? Kodinka? This is an abstract strategy game that comes with this beautiful magnet ceiling box. And these chunky, chunky pieces. Oh, that chunk. And these super flimsy cards. Mm. I guess he had a uh, splurge on these in the box. Gotta cut corners somewhere. I'm glad to hear that Dan likes them chunky because after having the twins, my game has expanded. You know what I'm saying? Uh, we managed to get away and play this game all by ourselves. Pick a color tile and then you try to get these four matches before your opponent can. So these tiles are like the Azul tiles, but they're a bit bigger. They're not quite as pretty, but I do like the bold colors. There are white sides and gold sides, and so you're doing a combination of swapping tiles and flipping tiles. You also get these bonus actions you can use. You know, at first I thought this was weird that you could move a row or rotate something, and I, the first game I only used this side. Second game, I put this into play and I played hard, and I won. So it took me a minute to figure out how that would be useful, but once I did, I crushed Dan. By like three turns. Yeah, by like three turns. Not that anyone's counting, by three turns. No one's counting. I won by at least three turns. We can highly recommend this game for two players. 
I don't know about three or four. I'd be open to playing it, but it's awesome at two. Chunky, chunky pieces. Uh, get chunky with it. Uh, 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 chunky. I feel like I'm letting you down because I don't know the words to your made up song. Pull it together, Dan. I mean, I, this is said, why I'm the winner. You just said chunky pieces a couple of times. It wasn't like. You know, that was like just, that was the chorus. <laughs> Two brothers set loose in a thrift store. This is Thrift Store Throwbacks. So that is our quick and easy three-minute tutorial on how to play Feast for Odin. Go Bolts! What? Go Bolts! Dude, Bolts is what it is. I'm talking about the Chargers, bro. The L.A. Chargers, ever heard of them? Football season's on. You want your, your, you're an L.A. Chargers fan now? But... No one likes the Chargers. They were just like so much that they got kicked out of San Diego. You should like, be. You I should, like wait, wait, I don't get. You're a Chargers fan. No. You should be a Rams fan. <laughs> okay, you know like what, dude? You just like the Rams because they're popular. You're a typical LA fan. Only like them when they're good. As soon as they're bad, you're gonna forget about them. You're gonna become a Charger fan like me because they're already bad. <laughs> oh man, the wait. letters in there. Wait, 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 wait. What? Weren't we raised in NorCal? Yeah. Aren't we? Weren't we born and raised as Niner fans? Oh yeah. Steve Young, that guy's awesome. Yeah, right? Yeah, go Niners. That's right, Niners are way better. Yeah, dude. You know what, really, it's, the thing is, it's just like, you can root for whatever team you want, just don't be a Raider fan. All right, so this is NFL Rush Zone, and I cannot stress enough how easy it is to make sure that you only get to play as your team, baby. Boom! Now in this game, it's ultimately just rolling dice. So if you're on offense and you're starting off at the 20-yard line, you're going to roll two dice. The defense is going to roll two dice. If you have the same or higher than them, you get to advance and get a first down. If you roll doubles like I just did, you get an extra 10 yards as a bonus. Bonus! Uh, and you're going to be trying to score goals. And that's all it is. We do kickoff returns. You're rolling dice. You can punt if you don't make a fourth down. You can try to kick field goals if you want to go for that instead of go for the first down. It's really just a dice chucker. It's kind of random. But there's like a couple little decisions. And the components are really cool because you have the football and things like that and football sports. But really, let's just get back to baseball. Okay? Thanks. So that was NFL Rush Zone. Two and four on yeah. I actually, you know what? Here's the thing. It's just that you're rolling a movie, you're just rolling dice. Yeah. But it's fine, honestly. It's totally fine. And, like, they go into a lot of production. Like, every yeah. single team is represented. It's just kind of marching up and down the field. Like, it's kind of fun. I actually kind of dig it. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it just gives you something to do until baseball comes back. That's finally. True. That's all I'm waiting for. That's all I want. So that's going to be it for us, folks. If you need something to do before baseball comes back, go check out our YouTube channel at The Brothers Murph or watch us live on Twitch and come interact with us. And uh, until next time, I guess we'll see you in the, in the end zone doing one of these dances where you do the spike and you kind yeah, of... you can dance now. Today, I want to discuss house rules. I'm Mark Maya. Welcome to Board Game Coffee. Now, as you could probably guess by the setup, our house rule today involves Zombicide Black Plague. Now, when playing Zombicide, we have a few house rules that we like to implement to spice things up. One of those being, the character that finds the key to any specific door is the character that has to open that door. Now, if I remember correctly, the rules state that once anybody finds the key, anybody else in the party can open that door. But we don't like to do things the easy way here at the Board Game Coffee household. Another rule we like to implement is if a character in our party gets run over rah, by a group of zombies and killed, we like to drop all their weapons in that space. That way, if anybody wants them, they're gonna have to go get them. <laughs> and to spice some things up, if that character was the character with the key, the key is there too. So if you want to get through that door, you're gonna to have to go pick it up. And last but not least, we like to take that dead player, put him up on his feet, and consider him a runner. Now, those are these zombies, the guys that run really fast. So we basically turn that player into an AI-controlled zombie and hunt down the other players with that character. And that's fun. And not only is it fun, it feels like it fits into the theme better than just sitting there dead. I mean, these are zombies, they killed you, makes sense you turn into a zombie. Well, I guess in, unless they don't leave anything left to turn into a zombie, but what fun is that? Now, those were a few house rules that we like to implement when playing Zombicide Black Plague. So my question to you is, do you have a house rule you like to implement to a game you like to play? And what are they? 
So let me know in the comments below. So that way we can maybe start something here. Let's share our house rules. Let's liven things up. No pun intended. Zombies. Dead. Howdy folks, welcome to By The Numbers. My name is Hunter Thomason from The Family Showdown. Each episode of By The Numbers, we take a look at a board game numeric related topic. This week's topic, where do you buy your board games? With the Spill Fair in Essen recently wrapping up, I was curious. I see these massive halls of board games coming out of Essen and Gen Con and places like that. And I was curious, what percentage of people get majority of their games at conventions? I put up one of my infamous polls up over on the Dice Tower Facebook group and I asked, where do you buy the majority of your games? And the results are in. Let's take a look at the handy dandy chart. And I was shocked to see that less than 1% of people get the majority of their games at conventions. The vast majority of people get their games online, which is not surprising, but I thought there would be more people getting games at conventions with these massive, massive, like to the ceiling stacks of games they bring home from the fairs. I was happy to see the number of good discussions that came out of that poll and a couple of comments that I thought were very important. A lot of people get their games secondhand. There's so many sources for secondhand games. You can go through the Facebook buy and sell groups, the BGG marketplace. You can do swaps and math trades and flea markets at conventions. There was some discussion about breaking out Kickstarter from the online category and making it a separate category because a number of people mentioned that the majority of their games come through Kickstarter. I personally do a little bit of all of those things. I buy games online. I buy games at my local game store. I buy games through Kickstarter. I buy games at conventions. I may have a problem. In the comments below, tell me where you buy the majority of your games. I'll see you next time. Hey everyone, Chris Renshaw here. Waterdeep Dragon Heist. The first time I heard about this, I thought it was going to be about something having to do with like stealing dragon eggs or something like that. No, it's not like that at all. In fact, dragon is the term used for the gold piece in the city of Waterdeep. This is an adventure and a supplement at the same time. So even if you don't play the D&D 5th edition supplements, you're going to want to check out this latest release from Wizards of the Coast. In the first half of Waterdeep Dragon Heist is an adventure set for players levels 1 through 5 as it runs them through different portions of Waterdeep as there is a rumored cache of millions upon millions of gold pieces and the players have stumbled onto the path that might lead them towards getting said money. The adventure itself is pretty neat, and the way they run it in this book is very interesting. However, there is a big problem with this, and that is, if you're a beginner DM, I don't recommend trying to run this game. Mainly because the way they do the different scenarios, it's designed to kind of be less railroady of an adventure, so instead of giving you the go A, B, C, D, they kind of give you A and E and then a bunch of other options in the middle of how you get from A to E. However, that in mind, we go to the second half of the Waterdeep Dragon Heist book, and that is a plethora of information on one of the most famous cities in the D&D setting, which is Waterdeep. For instance, did you know that anyone that's able to do any sort of magic is required by law to register with one of the Magistars as being having some magical ability? I didn't know that. Even if you're not using the adventure that's in here at all, there's a whole bunch of information that is helpful about the laws, the political structure, how the city is laid out, what's in each section of the city that could give you some ideas for your next adventure to kind of spice it up. Definitely recommend picking up Waterdeep Dragon Heist, if nothing but for the information on the lore of the setting that is Waterdeep. What do you think? Do you like adventure books that also have another purpose as far as a bunch of supplemental information, or you prefer those lines clearly divided between your books? Let me know down in the comments below. And in the meantime, may all your hits...
secrets. Happy breakfast everyone, and today I'm going to talk to you about Orbis. Now the game takes place over 15 rounds, and on each round you're going to take a tile. Now 14 rounds of those, they're going to be sort of these region tiles. They can be like volcanic, they can be sort of water based, there's sort of deserty ones, green ones, ones with temples and stuff like that. And then one round you're going to choose a god, and that's basically going to give you sort of a way of getting some bonus points with the other tiles giving you points or worshippers along the way. Worshippers are going to be used in their various colours for basically getting you, allowing you to buy other tiles on future turns rather than having to take them as sort of wild tiles, flipping them upside down that lose you points but are multicoloured for the structure you're building. Now, it all sounds very good, but it turns out to be a really abstract game. And that's because very quickly these worshippers become coloured cubes. You no longer care what they are. The artwork on the tiles is relatively beautiful. It, it creates a sort of a very stunning pyramid world. But even that soon becomes, ah, I've got this row of reds, I need a red to carry on. And you really lose the theme because of it. And I think that's a real detriment to the actual game because all of a sudden it's just an abstract, very sort of vibrant game with very little meaning of why you're doing this or anything like that. Anyway, that's Orbis and I'm Oliver East, signing out. Welcome to The Pitch. Hi everyone, this is Ilka and um, it's the Monday after Essen closed. Essen Spiel 18, the biggest game fair in the world, um, and we spent every day there last week. We had all the foods, we played all the games, we met friends, we hung out, and as our son said, uh, we had the best week of our lives. And then this happened. This is the Essen loot table. This is what Dave proudly displays in our house and what he posts on the internet. Uh, all of this, he, he got all of this, I got this, and I didn't even buy this, I got this. I bought one game, this one. So, I don't know what to do, I don't know what to say, because he says, I'm gonna do reviews about all these games. That's his newest loophole. And it's probably right, because he's gonna do it, but I don't know where we will put all this. There's lots of hobbies, aren't there? Kind of inside the board game hobby. Many of which I'm not very good at. I'm not particularly crafty in any useful way. I'm fairly manipulative, but I don't think that counts. But one thing recently I set my, I set my little mind to is crafting an insert for Seven Wonders Duel, a game I like now for some reason. Who knows? I think I, think I love it. Who knows? It's, I think it's great. And I thought I could open it up, get this stuff out, and I could make a great insert out of some foam core and some super glue and a safety knife. I didn't use a safety knife, did I? Use a Stanley knife. Different, more dangerous. Living on the edge. Did hurt myself. Can't really see it great. It's got things, there's cards, space for stuff. Oh, it's great, it's sturdy, it's fantastic. It's abundantly average, but I'm very proud of it. And I think I might do it again. And I really think I achieved something when I made that insert for Seven Wonders Door. It's not the best insert in the world, but I enjoyed making it for some reason. I even sleeved the cards like a madman. I think it's really important that you kind of just do parts of the hobby to enjoy them, not to be good at them. I mean, you might get good with practice. One would hope that that's how practice works, but I'm probably not gonna get good at making inserts, but I enjoyed it. And that's got a worth all of its own, I think. Doesn't it, maybe? It's crafting time, which is good for your soul, I think, a little bit. There's always gonna be people that you think are better than you. Chasmala. I enjoyed it, so I think it was worthwhile. And that in itself makes it worthwhile. And that's it for another Board Game Breakfast. Yeah! Alright! Woohoo! 
We're about to start into the week, and I'm very excited. I'm back. I'm awake. I'm not jet lagged, and I'm ready to go. So, lots of things coming up. Don't forget, if you haven't signed up for Dice Tower Con yet, uh, Dice Tower West is sold out, but Dice Tower Con is still available. Just go to DiceTowerCon.com. Uh, man, I'm so excited. PAX Unplugged is on the horizon. The Dice Tower Retreats are on the horizon. Dice Tower Cruise. Woof. It's exciting. Well, until next time, I'm Tom Basso. You've been watching Board Game Breakfast. See you next time. Thanks for watching Board Game Breakfast. Tune in each week for your daily dose of gaming goodness with Tom Vassell and all the gang. Until next time, I'm Eric Summerer, and you've been watching Board Game Breakfast, a Dice Tower production, sponsored by Cool Stuff, Inc., an amazing place to buy board games. Cool stuff in stock at coolstuffinc.com.